Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about how Jesus, when he was going through that last week, faced rejection. Uh, how many of y'all faced rejection? I got the nicest church in the world. Nobody's ever faced rejection. We all have, haven't we? We all have. And uh, the thing that is amazing, we all need to learn how to face rejection. And I, I know that Christ is the example. The, but the more that I, I learn about Christ and His amazing love, it's it just amazes me that he went through what he went through for us. How he faced so very much. Most people, when they love, they're looking for something in return. But Christ, all he cared about was us. It was the most unselfish love you could ever imagine. His love means to cherish. And I, he cherished us. It's to place value, to place yourself under another. And that's everything that he went through. All that he faced. Sometimes we believe that, well, Jesus was the Son of God, so when he faced it, it wasn't like what you and I face. Really? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. He went through everything like we go through, yet without sin. If you faced rejection, so did he. And the one thing that I know and I think you know as well is that there's nothing that we went through that can compare with what he went through. Feeling accepted is one of the most powerful feelings mankind can feel. But being rejected is the absolute opposite of that. Isaiah 53, you don't have to turn there. Kale will have it for you up on the screen. But it says in verse 1, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he that is God shall grow up before him. Jesus as a tender plant. As a root out of dry ground. This is the definition. All those hundreds of years before Jesus was born. He has no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. This is the definition of Christ. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Look what it says in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. God allowed Jesus to be despised. The King of kings, the God of the universe, who gives us life, he allowed him to be rejected because man would rather choose their own ways, their own thoughts, than love the great gift of heaven for us. So many of us have been taught to love by the world. That's how it's fashioned. Lance was 100% right when he said that our children are being raised and taught by social media. The very loud minority that says everything's got to be like them. But the family and God's family, the church, needs to let the kids know there's something different. There's something better. It's not about us. But we live in a world where God teaches us that there's something greater. And the greatest thing that we can do is love Him and receive His love that was poured out for us. But if we could learn that example, we could look at each other 
and learn to love each other as God loves you. And let that love grow in us. And how much better we would be because of that. So in the next few moments, we're going to walk with Jesus down that last week. We're going to think about some of the things that he faced. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Lord, I pray in the next few minutes by the power of the Holy Spirit as you speak. Lord, I know I can read the Word. I can preach the Word. And it will fall upon ears. But Lord, what we're asking you to do is to speak to our hearts. That's where change occurs. That's where the glory shines. That's where the goodness comes. All praise and glory and honor to you. My heart pledges allegiance to you today. You gave up so much. And you went through so much for us. Father, may we give you glory and honor today. Speak to us plainly. Speak to us clearly. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the book of Mark, we're going to walk through a little bit of Mark 14 and 15. And I want you to face, face some of the rejection that Jesus faced that day. And you have to begin with Judas. You have to begin with Judas. Look what it says in Mark chapter 14, verse number 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, one of the twelve disciples that Jesus called out, he went to the chief priest to betray him, God's son, the one that he knew that he had walked with for three and a half years, who had never seen Jesus give a bad look, say a negative word, all he had ever seen in Jesus was love and kindness. All he had ever seen is Jesus uh, focus on those that were in need. He cared like no one had ever cared. When he preached, he preached truth. But here we see that he left, went to the chief priest to betray Christ to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. Hold on, let's put it on the scales. We got the great Jesus on one side and money on the other side. And Judas chose money. The love of money is the root of all evil. What It's about us. What we want, what we think we can get. Money. He had been around the greatest human, the Son of God who came and born in human flesh. I, I wonder what it was like when they sat around at night and just talked around the, the campfire to, to wake up and to look over and see the Son of God asleep. The one who always encouraged Him. By the way, the one who knew Him the one that when he called him to come and follow him, he knew would be the one who would betray him. And yet Jesus never treated him any differently than anyone else. Church, listen to me real well. If you want the love of God, you're going to have to act like having the love of God. You're going to have to choose the love of God. If you walk around in this world and you treat people the way they treat you, that's not Christ's way. It's not. If you walk around in this world and, and if somebody spits at you, the first thing you want to do is spit back at them. What you're doing is getting down on their level and living by their level and their standards. Jesus came to raise the standards of what love is and to teach us that great love. Make sure you don't make their problems your problems. Judas had a problem. He was hung up on money. But Jesus didn't go down to his level. What he kept doing was trying to raise Judas up to God's level. Judas may have rejected Jesus, but Jesus never rejected Judas. Look at not only Judas, but look at the rest of the disciples. Look down in 
verse number 26. They had been up in the upper room in verse 26, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I guess that time in the upper room uh, was such a moving time, and, and they sang a familiar song, and then they, they left uh, the, the upper room. They, they left Jeru uh, the city of Jerusalem, and as they were leaving out, Jesus said something to them there. Look what he says in verse 26, or verse 27. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. He says, not just one. He says, all of you will leave me tonight. All of you will leave me tonight. As a Christian, we're different. I don't know about y'all, but the, the Bible talks about we are a peculiar people. Aren't we really? Amen. Um, we don't go with the flow. You know, if, if, you're, if you're petting the, the, the cat against the fur, turn it around. But yet the world says we're supposed to go with them. They're all swimming one way up downstream, but we're called to go upstream. We're called to be different. We're called to have a love, it's different love, a different standard, something that's totally different. You ever heard the difference between the broad way and the narrow way? Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said in Matthew 7, 13, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there were many who go in by it. The wide gate, the easy gate, the, the well-traveled road, but we're called to the narrow gate where few go that leads to love, it leads to life, it leads to blessing. We're not like them. But when push came to shove, all the disciples would reject Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of them, one of them left so quickly when his clothes got caught in the, the bushes there, he just went streaking. First streaker in the Bible since the Garden of Eden. Just to get away. Look what it says in verse 29. There's Peter that was there. Y'all remember Peter? There was 12 disciples, but there was Peter, James, and John, those inner three that Jesus would invite to be spend the most time with him. But even out of those, there was a lot of intimate conversations in the Bible about Peter and Jesus. Look what it says in verse 29. When Jesus said, all of you will be made to stumble tonight, Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble... Yet I will not be. Not I. Even if all of those, but yet I won't. Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke vehemently, and if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Wonder how it hurt to see one who would pronounce such great love. It wouldn't be very long and the soldiers would take Jesus and Peter would follow at a distance. It wouldn't be long and, and Jesus, Peter would be warming himself by the fire and Peter would deny him three times. And when he denied him, he looked over and he saw Jesus. Their eyes met. And, and Peter remembered. I wonder what the look was that Jesus gave. I believe it was one of love. I see you. I hear you. You're rejecting me at this point. When I need a friend, you said you'd be there. You said you'd give your life for me, but you're just 
deny him, that you even knew me. To lose a friend. But before that happened, they went to a place called Gethsemane. Look what it says in verse 32. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he sat to his disciple, he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. So the, the disciples are at one place. He says, Come on, you three come with me. I've got something here. Uh, and they went over a little further. And, and Jesus said, you stay here. I'm going to go pray. He, he, it was very evident the weight that was on his shoulders. He was deeply distressed, Scripture says. And Jesus hits the knees and begins to pray. And they hear the prayers. But as Jesus prayed, it's late. It's been a long day. They're tired. And like in one of my sermons, they fell asleep. And Jesus went back to them and sees them there. And he says, could you not? Verse 37, could you not watch one hour? I need you. Stay with me. Watch. Pray. Pray. And he went and prayed again. In such agony, Scripture tells us that blood came through his brow. The pressure that was on him was such amazing. You ever been under a strain? And as you're under that strain... Your face would turn red. He prayed so hard with such intensity and passion that sweat, blood came like sweat from his brow. He went back there to sleep again. He went off to pray, saying the same words. Lord, if there's any way that this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. He went back there were asleep again. He prayed the third time using the same words and came back. Are you still asleep? And he woke him up and said, listen, it's too late. They're coming. They're coming. That day he lived with rejection. Over and over and over. Well, the soldiers took him and they took him before the council. Look what it says in verse number 60. The high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? He kept silent. Answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, here he gets to the very point of it. Listen, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. By the way, that is the term. I am. When Moses was before the burning bush and said, who will I say sent me? You tell him, I am sent you. He said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. They should have bowed on their knees right then and there. You're the Messiah? Amen. They should have fell down. One day, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2. But that day, the leaders of the Judaism, the, the leaders of the religion, instead of accepting the Messiah, they rejected Him. Verse 63, they tore His clothes and said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard, here's the words they said about Christ, the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him to be deserving of death. Deserving. Did y'all hear that? What did he do to deserve death? Love? Be kind? Heal the sick? What did he do? Preach the truth? But once again, he was rubbing the cat in the wrong way and they wouldn't turn around. 
So they got angry, rejected him. Look in chapter 15, verse number 6. Now he's before Pilate. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder, remember that, in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do as he was always done for them. And Pilate answered them saying, Do you want me to release to you the, the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest and the crowd, or excuse me, he stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them, Well, what, what then do you want me to do with him who is, whom you call the king of the Jews? They cried out, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? They cried out all the more, crucify him. Come on, church, listen. Let's just pause for a second. This man left heaven out of love. He humbled himself. And yet, the ones who should have been singing his praise chose a murderer over him. One who didn't care about life over one who all he cared about was blessing their life. Can you feel the depth of rejection? You would rather have him than me. Church, if you can, just remember how, how deep it hurts our souls. Don't think he was different. He was quiet, and he heard the crowds yell for his death. Any one of us, if we were going down the road, and, and, and we saw a car over there that had wrecked and, and turned and flipped, all of us would stop and, and get out of our car and run down there and see if there's anything we could do to help. Because there's something within us that just wants to choose to help someone, right? Right? But yet, they had so flipped it that the one who had done nothing wrong, not only are they not going to help him, they're screaming for his death. So, <laughs> Pilate says, all right, go off. So then the soldiers took him away. Roman soldiers... At least somebody that's about to die, you give them a little common courtesy. Look what it says in verse 16. Then the soldiers led him away into the hollow praetorium and they called together the whole garrison. So everybody's there. And, and they clothed him with purple. They twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. They're mocking him. They struck him on the head with a reed. So that crown of thorns, they take a reed and they hit him on the head, literally to, to shove it down. Verse 19, then they spat on him. Is there anything more disrespectful? And they mocked, they, they mocked him by bowing the knee. They, they acted like they were worshiping him. Verse 20, and when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Verse 29, let's talk about the people that are watching. And those who passed by blasphemed him wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. 
Likewise, the chief priest also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, he saved others. Isn't that a testimony? They could not deny that he helped others. A man with a withered hand could stretch it out. People that had leprosy, uh, an incurable disease, were made absolutely brand new. He went to, a, uh, to the place where Lazarus, who had been dead for days, and said, Lazarus, come forward. And the man who was dead came back to life. The woman with the issue of blood just touched the hem of his garment and he, she was healed. The, 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 the leading centurion, his servant was healed. Jairus, miles from home, Jesus spoke the word when he got there and raised his child from the dead. They could not deny but this is how they frame it. How do they frame it? He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. They wouldn't have believed. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now let's talk about the worst one. Verse 33. Now when the sixth hour had come, three o'clock in the afternoon, or basically noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. Darkness. Nature was not going to shine on this. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The miracle of the cross is that Jesus bore my sin. The one who was sinless became the sacrifice. For the first time in all of eternity, there was a division in the Trinity. God can't look at sin. That's why we needed a Savior. He came to give us heaven, but sinners can't be in heaven. God can't accept sin. He can't allow it into His presence. So when Jesus became my sin, the Father had to look away. Rejection is hard. Rejection is difficult. We want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We need to be loved. We were built to be loved. Our heart is blessed and becomes complete when we are loved. That's the length of the love of God for us. When he became sin, he said, my God. He didn't say my father. Why have you forsaken me? He knew, but he cried out. There is no greater love. This world will spit you up or chew you up and spit you out. This world will take you, use you, abuse you, and cast you aside. You probably have just a few people in this world that know everything about you and love you unconditionally, that are always there to serve you, that are always placing you and cherishing you and, and placing you on the, on the pedestal. We talked about this in my Sunday school class this morning. I said, if, if you know five people who love you in such a way, you're a cajillionaire. I know one, Christ. I've got others that I'm so blessed, but I'll tell you it's fewer than five who love me like that. Oh, trust me, I know. I can be wadded up and cast aside. 
My name will be forgotten, long gone. We all have faced that. Family not talking to each other. Best friends not talking to each other. We've all felt rejection, but I just want you to know, nobody felt rejection like Christ. He knows how you feel. And He came to give you love. Nothing will fill the, the hole in your heart, the vacuum in your life. No one will, will bless you and take you to a, a level like you've never lived before than the one who is overcome. Yeah, you've faced rejection. We all have. The Bible says those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall save, shall uh, suffer persecution. We're all going to go through it. But the greatest rejection of all is if you reject Jesus. No one loved you like Jesus. Rejection on earth hurts for a moment. If you reject Jesus, it'll last forever. Why would you reject such great salvation? Why would you reject such great love? God has one purpose, and that's to pour out all of His love on you, to bless you. Why would you turn away from that? I tell my wife every day I love her. Every day. I do everything that I know possible for her to know that I choose her. I cherish her. I value her. But that's how we're supposed to value Christ. He's taught me how to love. Oh, what love. Why would we reject the one who can love like that? Yet, there are people who do it all the time. All they need to do is admit their sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Repent. That means I turn from it. I walk away from it. I don't want that in my life anymore. I want to do the 180. I want to start chasing the right things instead of chasing the wrong things. Then invite Jesus to come in and cleanse you. To save you. Give your life to Him. And He'll give His life to you. You pledge your love to Him, He'll pledge His love for you. And He'll keep you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever in blessing. Why turn down such great salvation? Have you been rejected? He knows what it feels like. He came to complete you.